We continue this week with our second to last Bible story, The Preacher Never Told You. This one is unique in the series in that uh, we, uh, Jesus is the main character. And this is one that seems very out, of, very out of character with what we typically read about Jesus. Um, I'm maybe happy to tell you there's not a body count today. One, one tree is going to die and that's it. So that's pretty good for this summer. Um, and this comes from Mark 11, verses 12 through 14 and 20 through 22. It comes just on the verge of Holy Week um, in, in the, uh, if you're thinking about where this fits in the Christian calendar and in the timeline of Jesus' life. So hear this from Mark 11. Hear this good news. On the following day when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see perhaps whether, whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered, have faith in God. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I've been thinking a lot about bearing fruit and what that means, maybe in no small part because of the time of year that we're in. Um, when I looked outside just before the crazy rainstorm last night, um, I noticed that my tomato vines are getting just big enough to where they're starting to reach inside the door. I think they could take over the house at any moment. Um, and if you're a gardener, you know that we're kind of at peak squash right now. You are probably pulling more squash off of your vines than you can eat. You're not keeping up. No one even likes squash that much anyway. And so you're giving it to anyone who will take it. Friends, relatives, you're giving squash to strangers on the street if they'll take one or two. And... Um, other things are blooming and flowering as well. I have a peach tree in my backyard that every year provides a pretty good crop. This year it's a bumper crop. I, I had to thin it out because they were too thick. And even still, I have two by fours propped up under the branches of the peach tree. It's that full. Not that I'm going to get to enjoy any peaches because what will happen is the birds are going to land and they're going to take one bite out of every peach on my tree and then they're going to fly off because, and I can't believe this is a sermon statement I've said twice this year, but birds are jerks, and that's how they go. It makes me think of that uh, the story, that not, not the birds, but the fruitfulness and, and, and all of these vegetables and fruit and everything coming in makes me think of an earlier story when Moses went, uh, he was on the edge of the promised land, and he sent spies into the promised land to just sort of get a peek at what God had in store for the, for the Hebrew people when they entered the promised land and what kind of land would it be? And they came back and they said, oh, we know it's a really good land because there are pomegranate trees and fig trees everywhere. It's, it's a rich land and, and I love that because how do they know it's going to be a good land? Has it got mineral wealth? Is it, no, it's, it's got lots of good food to eat. I guess there's just something about having fresh pomegranates and fresh figs that makes the promised land the promised land. I think Jesus would say the same thing, um, at least about the figs, only when he walks up to this tree, it's not fig season. This is Holy Week. It's before Passover. It's early spring. And Jesus is hungry. It's a strange story with Jesus coming toward Jerusalem and he has that hungry, you know that feeling. Sometimes it happens in church and you start to think, this preacher is just never going to wrap up and I'm so hungry. And Jesus, you, know, you have that sort of hollow feeling in your tummy, almost like a sick feeling. It's not a good feeling when you're really very hungry and, and Jesus is coming up toward Jerusalem. He is that hungry and, and you know, granted, most of us today in the 21st century, we don't go around eating just fruit we find off of trees unless you live in Arizona or something. But, but let's, to, to put that into a 21st century context, I bet you do, especially if you're still working, but if, if you think back to your working life, if you're retired, you probably know 
what time within a few minutes or so during the day you're going to need that post-lunch snack because you know you're not going to get to, like dinner's still a couple hours away. For me, it's 3.38. It's not 3.37. It's not 3.39. At 3.38, I'll get hungry and I'm going to need a little snack. Now, if you're lucky, just a little sugar rush, by the way, nothing, we're not rolling out a meal, but, but if you're lucky, you will have a snack machine nearby that you can go to. We don't appreciate the miracle of the snack machine enough. <laughs> this is something that would have blown your ancestors' minds as they were chasing woolly mammoths around the plains of New Mexico or Northern Europe or wherever you're from. Or, um, but it's a miracle machine. It's, it's a little box that sits and just waits for you to give it a tiny amount of money and it will give you food. That is what makes America great, is we invented that. We gave it to the world. There's, there's a snack. You, you probably have snack machines in your school, in your work, at the mall. I was in my doctor's office a few weeks ago. There was a snack machine in the waiting room. It was, right, it was full of candy bars and, and potato chips. It was right next to a poster about diabetes awareness. I thought, <laughs> someone missed the sense of irony in that, but that's okay. Um, and so you go to your snack machine, the miracle machine of our age, and you rub your dollars very nice and flat because snack machines only like flat money. There can be no crinkles in it. That is sin. And it will take it, you give it your tithe, and it gives you salvation in return through the twisting rotation of a little spring, a little metal coil with a Snickers bar or potato chips or animal crackers or whatever your snack is that you like and you push the buttons and it rotates and it gives you something to solve your hunger except on those days when you're hungriest and then something else will happen it'll still turn the little coil thingy and you'll see your Snickers bar for me it's actually not Snickers it's Kit Kat bar It'll just keep moving forward and moving forward and it'll come to right about here and then what happens? You know what's going to happen on your hungriest days. It stops right there. It doesn't quite tip over into the slot and that's completely infuriating every single time, isn't it? I know if I were giving this sermon to people in Bangladesh or Burundi, they would be rolling their eyes right now at, our, at us poor Americans and our little American problems, right? But, but it is a problem. And yes, there are bigger problems in the world. But it's aggravating. Well, as far as I can tell from this text, this story, fig trees were the miracle snack machines of the pre-modern world. Fig trees we're great. You could, you know, I mean, you could, I guess, just walk up and pick up a piece of fruit off of them. And, and Jesus here, it occurs to me, seems to be in this same moment where he's hungry, really hungry. But then the first century equivalent of the snack machine coming into sight and, and, and stopping its rotation at just the wrong moment sort of happens um, because there's not exactly a bumper crop of figs on this tree. Not a fig to be found, in fact. And he's so mad, he's so angry. In fact, you, like any of you all know the term hangry? It's like hungry and angry. I, my parents gave me a, a sign that said hangry on it one year for Christmas or something. And they said, this is for you and you should learn this concept because we see it in your life all the time. And that's where Jesus is. He's a little hangry. And so he goes and he says to the tree, which first of all, he's talking to trees. That's hungry right there. He's delirious. Says, may you never bear fruit again. How melodramatic is that? <laughs> but Jesus isn't just venting because the text says that the disciples, they came back the next day and they point, they, they notice that, like, geez, Jesus has a, like a little bit of a godfather streak in his DNA somewhere because that tree the next day, it's not just that it's not going to bear fruit, it's wilted, it's wilted all the way down to the roots. Whatever Jesus says, it made a difference. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. I think I would maybe wash my back around Jesus and just be careful not to push him too far, but... 
But that's part of what I think makes this story so interesting because this is not the kind of Jesus. I mean, this really is a Bible story the preacher wouldn't tell you because it's not the side of Jesus that we like to talk about. You know, we like Jesus when Jesus is, is meek and mild and he's helping the low or he's calling out the powerful or, or he's speaking prophetically or, or most of all when he's doing something like healing. I, I, I don't know of any other stories where Jesus is destroying, not like this. Especially when you consider the circumstances. It is early spring. Why would he expect figs? to be on this tree. So, so why, is so, why is Jesus so mad at this fig tree when it's not even in season? And, and even, if he, even if he understood that, here's the other part I don't get whenever I read this text. Jesus can perform miracles. He's healed people. He has pulled a coin out of a fish's mouth. You know what Jesus did once when he didn't have enough food? He fed 5,000 people. Why not just snap your fingers? This is why I should be in charge, because I would just snap my fingers and like some giant fig would grow on the tree. Like that would be better, right? I don't mean that seriously that I should be in charge. I'm pretty happy to let God do that. But, but all that to say, let's step a little beyond what's actually happening here and look at maybe how this text speaks a little bit in metaphor because maybe there's something deeper happening than just Jesus having a bad day because his, because his, uh, there's a rumbling in his tumbling. First of all, let's talk about fig trees. Fig trees are great. They're great trees. You can plant fig trees almost anywhere. You can plant them in crummy soil, in rocky soil, in a bad spot. They're almost like the weeds of the tree world. They will do just fine no matter where you plant them. What's more, uh, most fruit trees, you're going to plant it, and maybe the next generation will get to enjoy something from that little seed that you plant. They take decades, um, certainly to grow up, and, and decades to uh, absolutely to bear fruit. Fig trees, if you plant it from a seed, they can be bearing fruit seven years in. If you plant a sapling, you can get fruit from fig trees two or three years in. They're very prolific little fruits, uh, little trees, and they have two crops a year. They'll provide fruit for up to 50 years, that's, that's sort of their lifespan, their productive lifespan. And not only that, but how many of y'all like have eaten a fig and you've pulled it open? Uh, I'm not talking like either, I'm talking either the fresh kind or the dried kind. I'm not talking about the ones that come in Newton form, but <laughs> the, you peel them open and what do you see inside? Just hundreds of these little pods, these little seeds that when you bite down, they give you that crackly kind of texture, sort of like you're eating nature's Rice Krispie treat. And each one of those little tiny pods is a seed. There's about 725 of those little seeds in every single fig. That's a lot of potential seeds to grow a lot of trees out there in the world. They can go on to be more tree, trees with little tiny pods of, of, of more delicious fruit with more seeds in it and so on. You start to get this sense that when Mark and the other writers of the Bible talk about fig trees, it's not just that they like figs or how they taste. It's something deeper than that. They represent something, a richness, a fruitfulness of life and vitality. And so what does this mean when we look in Mark, and, and this is... You know, this is the miracle tree that's nature's always abundant snack machine and there's no fruit on it. And more important, if this is a metaphor, what else is Mark talking about here? Which I think we can assume this is a metaphor. What is this barren fig tree supposed to be? Well, for that, you have to look at what else is happening in Mark. What else, and, and just a basic thing you can do is say, look at, like, what other episodes are before this text and after this text? And, and of course... I read a few verses and then skipped ahead Let's go and read a few more. What's going on in the middle? Lots of conflict with the religious elites. Lots of conflict with the religious folk. In fact, between these two episodes is sort of the, um, the biggest conflict that Jesus has and the biggest run-in he has with, with the religious elites because it's when Jesus cleanses the temple. It happens right between these two episodes. Jesus walks into the temple, this focal point of, of his people's spirituality, where you come and, and you have as close of an experience 
with the living God as you're going to get. Now, we, of course, believe a little differently about Jesus, that, that Jesus is that experience for us. But, but for Jesus' people, this is the place where God is closest and nearest to us. And what's happening there? Is the work of justice being done? Is there compassion on display? Are, are people uh, lavishing riches on the poor and, 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 and going to the people that God instructs the, 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 the people to go to? No, it's transactional. It's, it's paying temple taxes. It's people getting rich off of the spiritual needs of others. It's as if Jesus is saying, you, you people are just like this barren tree. You're supposed to be fruitful. There's no reason for you not to. You're all concerned here about keeping the rituals and making sure the temple tax gets paid so you can pocket the profit. You don't give a fig, pun intended, about the people who need God's love, and it doesn't surprise me because you don't seem to care much about God anyway because you don't care about me. In other words, this idea of being a part of God's people, Jesus is asking if you are part of God's people, why don't I see compassion in here? And justice work happening. Why has spirituality become a transaction? It's a matter of bearing fruit. And it's very easy for us to, to sit in comfortable church circles today and talk about that and how bad those people a long time ago were. Um, but could Jesus have the same conversation with us? We as individuals? We as the church? We're called to be fruitful toward God. Our faith is supposed to Bless others and bless God. Tom Berlin is the, the United Methodist Bishop of the Florida area. Um, and I read a book of his a few years ago. He was a pastor in Northern Virginia at the time. He talks about being out, um, taking a road trip. And he, as he was driving along, he drove past two churches out in the country in the, in the rolling hills of the Shenandoah Valley in, in uh, Virginia. And... and two little country churches and he drove by one and it was so pretty and well kept and the paint was fresh and there as he went the pretty little white steeple in the front as he drove by there were four signs out front one of them it said uh friday is food bank day with an uh, exclamation point another one said something about a children's program that was coming up another one was everybody's welcome and, and he noticed all that. And he, as he kept driving, he drove by another church. And this one, also a little country church, cute little country church, but not very well kept. The paint was peeling off of the walls on the outside. The windows, some of them were broken out. But as he went by, he noticed that the room was just full. He couldn't see um, inside very far because the room was so full. And that piqued his interest, so he pulled over. And he walked up to see what was going on in this church. He stepped up the steps of the porch which uh, sort of bowed under his weight because the wood was rotting and, and, and not well kept and, and came to the front door just to sort of peek in and, and look at what was happening inside, expecting some children's program or a Sunday school gathering or something. But when he looked inside, it was full of hay because the church had closed and some farmer had decided to use it as a, as a barn. I think about that story sometimes because uh, up until recently, I was the chair of our conference trustees, which means when a church close, uh, closes, uh, I would be among the people who would go and, um, and, and help close it. I, there's, there's a fair number, unfortunately, probably five or six churches where I was the last United Methodist in that building before we sold it. And with every one of those, I think about lost opportunities. Like, you know, we, we want to focus on the positive side of discipleship where we're pursuing and, and, and growing and bearing fruit, but, but it's also worth every once in a while thinking about, like, what were the places where we didn't bear fruit? Like, what happened in a church where it went from a place of life and vibrancy to a place where, where the doors needed to be shut? I can't help but wonder sometimes in each of us, in me and you and, and, and all of us, any of us, what about the fruit that's just never born? Because we don't take the chance. Because we don't, we do what's comfortable. We avoid the risk. Maybe one of the most dangerous things to our spirituality is when we do get comfortable, when we decide that we're just going to rest on our 
on our laurels, which was not a Methodist thing to do. The early Methodists were passionate and attentive to God's work in the world. They would tend their souls with the same kind of meticulous, with the kind of meticulous nature of a master gardener looking at how they could grow in grace day by day by day and looking out for one another and their neighbor and for God's glove to always be growing, always be there. As a church, can we always be asking, you know, if, if this church tomorrow was suddenly missing from the neighborhood, what else would be missing along with it that people would notice? Because we have to be bearing fruit. Having a big, outward-looking faith is an aspect of God's character. It's built right into our origin story. You know, the, the story in Genesis is that God created the world and everything and, and animals and plants and, and good things and fig trees. And finally, he created Adam and Eve. And what was his first thing that he wanted them to do? What was, was to be what? Fruitful. To be fruitful. Which, yes, that's kind of a command for them to go make babies and fill the earth. But it's also a command that goes deeper than that. That all of us can fill the earth with something. If we choose. So when we gather to worship, we have to ask, what's the fruit of that? Is that just about singing good songs? Is it about watching the preacher speak and harangue a little bit? Or, or when we worship, are we connecting our hearts and minds to the thing, to the, to the power that will grow in us something fruitful? It's the difference. We, we've talked about this a little bit in a few contexts of saying, you know, when we do ministry in the community, it's not about us being the best church in the community. We should always be striving to be the best church for the community. Bearing fruit, spiritually speaking, is when the inward things God's, that God does through grace, they manifest outward into meaningful things that point back to Christ's love. So I want to close with this. If, if you've eaten one of those figs and you've torn open the skin and seen all those little seeds inside, I want you to picture that. By the way, if you haven't, just go to the grocery store after church, buy a bag of figs and pull one open. It's... They're, in, they're not far off. Um, and look at all those little seeds and ask, what are the seeds that God has ready for you? What kind of fruit do you want to bear? I've seen that fruit be born these last few weeks here at St. John's. I think it's worth talking about. Um, let me tell you about our youth, okay? Um... A big group of our youth helped with Vacation Bible School. And I didn't take an actual head count, but as far as I could tell from the noise and the energy level, we had about 40,000 children at Vacation Bible School this summer. That's what it felt like. I'm a youth pastor by nature, by the way, not a children's minister, so I, my, I, like my energy level just went down as the week went by. But our youth were wonderful with those kiddos. They were the most energetic leaders in the room. They were as excited to be there as the kids were themselves most days. We had one little boy, one of the littles, and you know, you have those little kids where mom drops them off and slowly starts to sneak out of the room, and that, that little boy was not having that. And finally, she left, and, and any chance he would get for the first hour he was there every day, he would just bolt. He'd run for the door. I don't know what his plan was once he got outside, but I, I don't think he had a plan. Um, and one of our youth was so attentive with him, and as soon as he started to bolt, he would have made it out the door if it was up to me. Like, that, there, there was no security with me. But he would catch him, and he would redirect him, and, and before long, that little boy was having fun each day. We have wonderful youth at this church who pour as much of themselves into in ministry as anybody else here. And that would be worth remarking on just on its own, but earlier that one of those days, as I was walking in through the courtyard right over there where the grass is and where that herb garden is that sits up against the Family Life Center, and I didn't get her, I, I didn't get her permission to, to talk about this, so 
I, I hope it doesn't embarrass her, but as I was walking in one day at the herb garden, Pam Bear was with a young man from Mandy's farm showing him how to garden and get the weeds out without hurting the plants. And she was so patient with him and so kind and so nurturing. And, and if you know Pam, she makes it look effortless the way that she was nurturing that young man. You see it around here in small ways. I didn't get his permission, but a few weeks ago we had a newcomer who's first coming to church and you walk in on especially before 11 when y'all are here and it's a big crowd you, you, you got to watch newcomers come in sometimes because there's a real deer in the headlights moment when they walk through the doors and I saw him go to one of the doors and and Jim was the usher and greeted him like he was a friend and you could sort of see a little bit of calm <laughs> restored to his face as he came in we have a person in this church who learned that Somebody was without transportation and just without a second thought, he brought his bike a couple weeks ago and gave it to this person. There are so many little seeds, so much fruit that's born here. That's not to say we should rest on our laurels. We're coming up on our 75th anniversary and we cannot use that to just pat ourselves on the back and remark about how awesome we are. We've got to figure out what the next chapters are, what the next season of our church is. But it is to say that the last couple of weeks were not a particularly unusual week here at St. John's as far as kindness and decency and Christian spirit is concerned. I think if Jesus were to walk through these doors, I can't imagine him saying, may you never bear fruit again. I think he'd be able to point all over the place and be able to find places where fruit is being born, where Jesus is nurturing something, and where Jesus is growing and forming here in the hearts of people. Bit by bit, as the seasons change, as seasons always do. So let us pray. Gracious God, for the seed in which you plant in each one of us, we give you thanks. Help us as we try to grow it. Give us grace when we miss the mark. Show us, show us, Lord, how to bear fruit. Amen.